I'm allowed to use my bike here at the motorway services at South Mims on the A1M. And that's because it's an entry I can use. And that's just one of the oddities I'm going to be exploring in this video as I travel along the Great North Road. But I won't be on a bike the whole week. I'll also have a car. This car, this car, a Morgan Plus Four. Those lovely people at Morgan have let me explore the Great North Road in this fantastic vehicle. And this is the spanking new version of a car that Morgan has been making for 72 years. And I think it's the perfect car for going along the A1 of the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, before it was dueled, before it became a motorway, the old Great North Road. I'm Carlton Reed, and there are many fascinating stretches of this old Great North Road, if you know where to look. And I'll also be going a little bit off piece to explore the even older coaching road. No room for a passenger in the Morgan Plus Four, not when I've got the Brompton in the back anyway. So I'll be filming this all by myself. I'll be filming with the iPhone, which is what's doing this now. I'll be filming with the GoPro, of course. I'll be filming Eye in the Sky with my DJI drone. And I'll be filming with this thing, which is the Insta360 One X2, which as its name suggests, is a 360 degree camera. And the maker says it's a camera crew on a stick. Join me on my Brompton and my Morgan Plus Four as I pootle along the old Great North Road, serving up juicy morsels of highway history and staying at night in famous coaching inns. So many people down the centuries would have passed along that road. It shows you 12 miles per hour is the perfect speed for getting money off people. And this is the George of Stamford, one of the famous coaching inns of the Great North Road. I drove from London, well, okay, South Mims, to my hometown of Newcastle, using as much of the Great North Road as possible. This romantic highway was consigned to history in 1921, when unromantic officials at the newly formed Ministry of Transport decided to simplify navigation for elite motorists by binning evocative descriptive names and substituting them with anodyne A numbers. Watling Street, the Roman road from Dover to London, was changed to the boring old A2. Thomas Telford's Hollyhead Road from London was snuffed out, in name at least, becoming the A5 and the Great North Road became simply the A1. It was just the names that changed at first, but in a process of perpetual evolution, the old roads were straightened for speed and widened to increase capacity. New roads were built, often on novel alignments, and the old roads, the former turnpikes, many of them built on top of even earlier Roman roads, were bypassed forgotten. The original parts of the Great North Road, once plied by kings, queens, armies, stagecoaches, highwaymen, footpads, mail coaches, and more, faded into obscurity. But care to look, and there's plenty of evidence of where the Great North Road once ran, and how critically important it was to our national story. Many stretches parallel the A1M, and are labelled today as mere B roads, when in fact they form part of the original Great North Road. And with renumbering and rerouting down the years, fragments of even the clinically named A1 became lost. Stretches that were once full of life are now marooned, silent, forgotten. The same fate possibly awaits many of today's eight lane motorways. One day they too could fall into quietude. I started at South Mims because it's next to this stretch of what used to be the A1, built in the 1920s as the Barnet Bypass. And that might look like a normal bike path, but it's much older than you may think. 
It was tacked on in the 1930s as a Dutch-inspired innovation. One side of the bypass has disappeared under the adjacent motorway, but this stretch remains. Even though the road doesn't really go anywhere, it is a cycleway that has been this good and this wide since 1938, when the Ministry of Transport would only fund arterial roads if they came equipped with cycle tracks. The Barnet Bypass was itself bypassed in the 1950s with the building of the new A1, and later bypassed again and again by the motorway. All that remains is what appears to be a back road, and this incongruous cycleway. A few miles further on, and there's more evidence of the A1 as was. These cat's eyes are in a pub car park. But that's because the now tucked away Wagoner's Arms used to be to one side of the very busy Great North Road. Well, and over that away is the Great North Road. Just a fence there now, can't see anything. But that was the Great North Road that way, past the Wagoner's Arms. And that was the Great North Road, now closed off. Over there, you can probably hear it, is the Great North Road now, the A1M. Follow the route for a few hundred metres and the old A1 reappears in yet another pub car park. The old North Road followed Roman Ermine Street, starting at Bishopgate in the City of London. But I followed the coaching era Great North Road, which, for a while, started at the grand but long since demolished General Post Office building near St Paul's Cathedral. The Great North Road was hugely busy in the 17th and 18th centuries, but it died a slow death with the coming of the railways. Coaching inns, which specialised in changing horses and feeding hungry passengers in minutes, went out of business only to be rescued first by leisure-seeking cyclists in the 1880s, and then, 40 years later, by motorists also out for a leisurely spin. Cyclists and motorists wanted the same thing. They wanted to see the real England, the pre-industrial England, the coaching inn England. And they'd have used maps like this, the Bacon's Cycling and Motoring Map of the very early 1900s, probably 1900, 1902. And this map would have been used by both cyclists and motorists uh, because they were the same people at the time. They weren't uh, two tribes uh, at this uh, time. And the picture is on here, uh, which shows a lady cyclist and uh, a couple in a, well, in a motor car like I've got, like a Morgan almost, certainly an open top. Uh, vehicle. I promised you oddities. Well, these 1800-year-old Roman baths are very odd. Odd because they are nine metres beneath the motorway. The bath complex was discovered in 1960, but after 10 years of excavation, it was learned that an A1M extension would obliterate them. Cooler heads took charge and the baths were covered with a steel vault. Ironically, though, today's visitors don't have access to running water. The museum's toilets use composting, not flushing. This spot was incredibly famous. This is the Alconbury Milestone. And the A1M is here, the brand new motorway A1M. The old A1 is just to the side of it. And that one is even older, of course, because this is now Ermine Street, which goes from London all the way to York. It's where the two roads meet. So the coaching road, the 17th century road, the Great North Road, which became the A1, and Ermine Street, they meet at Alconbury. And you can see on there, it says London 64 miles, London 72 miles. This is where the two roads met, the old roads, and you had the choice from here. You went on the Roman Ermine Street, through Ware and into London, or, you went on the Great North Road, the coaching road. The 250-year-old obelisk told me that Stilton was nearby and I headed there along the Great North Road. That's it in the distance, bisecting Stilton. Yes, where the cheese sort of comes from. Don't have nightmares, kids. 
Stilton, now bypassed, is home to the Bell, one of the Great North Road's finest coaching inns. Dating from at least 1500, it was rebuilt in 1642 at the start of the English Civil War. Of course, like many coaching inns along the road, it claims to have a connection with a certain notorious highwayman, as hotel receptionist Bisma here tells me. So this is, we call it Dick's after Dick Turpin. They say that Dick Turpin actually haunts this building. Many people have said they've seen him. Hmm, OK. What's more certain is that the bell closed after construction of the A1 bypass and that when it reopened again 30-odd years ago, the hotel was beautified with a sympathetic restoration, including glassing over the original carriage entrance. Naturally, I finished my evening meal with a platter of selected Stiltons. I was up early the next morning to grab footage of the motorway junction at Norman Cross before flipping my drone to film this lozenge of lumpy pasture between the A1M and the A15. 220 years ago, this nondescript field was the site of the world's first purpose-built prisoner of war camp. With prefabricated buildings lugged from London, the camp, a new town really, had a population of more than double that of nearby Peterborough. Hundreds of troops guarded more than 7,000 French and Dutch sailors and soldiers captured during the Napoleonic Wars. The spiralling costs of the camp's erection in 1797 forced the Secretary of State to tell Parliament that extraordinary exertions involve extraordinary expenses. Sound familiar? Operational for 17 years, the Norman Cross camp was the final resting place for 1,770 prisoners, victims mostly of infectious disease rather than maltreatment. In 1914, 100 years after the dismantlement of the camp, a monument, topped with a brass eagle, was erected beside the Great North Road. The column was toppled in 1990 and the eagle stolen. It has never been recovered. The monument was moved to its current location in 2005. A rededication ceremony was attended by more than a thousand people and was led, appropriately enough, by the current Duke of Wellington. There's been a hotel on this site for more than 900 years and this is the George of Stamford, one of the famous coaching inns of the Great North Road. Kings, perhaps even a queen, have stayed here. Three kings at least, including Charles I, and then all sorts of famous guests have stayed here. Including novelist Sir Walter Scott, who in the early 1800s, wrote that a certain view of Stamford was the finest twixt Edinburgh and London. So Walter was describing the view from that church there, down onto the rest of Stamford. Charles Harper wrote in his 1901 book that Stamford compels enthusiasm from the first glimpse of it on entering to the last regretful backward glance on leaving. The sign over the George of Stamford must have been a very welcome sight for the travellers in the coaching in days on the Great North Road. The George at Stamford. It's a wonderful hotel. Wonderful and oozing with charm. There are many nooks and crannies dating from the hotel's past, starting from when it was a hospital and probably also an inn for the medieval Knights of St John of Jerusalem. During the coaching era, this was an open arch through to the stables, and the carriages left scratch marks. Travellers gathered in their respective north or south waiting rooms. Important river crossing here, of course, the River Welland and the Great North Road. So many people down the centuries would have passed along that road. The strategic importance of the Great North Road can be gleaned less than a mile out of Stamford, 
thanks to the impressive gatehouse of Burley House, built for Queen Elizabeth I's trusted advisor, Sir William Cecil. Fifty miles north, there's a country lane that peters out to become a gravel track. Prior to 1766, this was the Great North Road, and it had a rich history. On July 12, 1503, local bigwigs entertained Margaret Tudor at an imposing roadside inn. Travelling north to be crowned the Queen of Scots, the elder sister of the future King Henry VIII, stopped here. Riding on a palfrey, a type of light horse suitable for comfortable long-distance travel, the 13-year-old Margaret was literally heralded along the route, trumpeters sounding her progress. A large retinue of servants and nobles travelled at Margaret's side, their speed tempered by local dignitaries paying homage to the young queen-to-be. The good burghers of Retford even sent a couple of minstrels across to entertain her. This is Sherwood Forest, and this little part of Sherwood Forest is Rushy Inn Wood. And that behind me is Rushy Inn. And Rushy Inn is a former coaching inn. Today it's cottages, but it used to be a coaching inn, a very, very busy coaching inn on the Great North Road in the 1500s, 1600s, and then it kind of died away in the 1700s because the good people of Retford wanted something. They wanted something to change. Oh well, we've run out of Tarmac Road, which can only mean one thing, get the folding bike out. The people of Retford, a few miles over that way, petitioned Parliament to stop this road, the old coaching road, the Great North Road. They wanted to stop it from coming along here because it wasn't going through their town. And they wanted the business traffic, they wanted the travellers, the 12 miles per hour travellers on the coaches of the day to come through their town. Which I guess just shows you 12 miles per hour is the perfect speed for getting money off people, which says a lot about uh, how we should be designing our cities today, I guess. Anyway, yes, ting, 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 ting. <laughs> Let's go. It's just a short bit of gravel, this one. It's come from Gamson Airport on a little bit of tarmac, a little cut through here to a prison, and then it goes all the way not far, to Barnby Moor and the Ye old Bell, my final coaching in of the trip. Short and sweet on the old Great North Road. But now, before I can go to Barnby Moor and the Ye old Bell, I've got to turn round and go get the car. Ye old Bell at Barnby Moor has been welcoming Great North Road travellers for hundreds of years. Princess Victoria stayed here in 1835, two years before becoming Queen. It's a horsey inn, with Doncaster Racecourse nearby attracting guests such as crooner Bing Crosby, who stayed here in 1966. Recent works uncovered a segment of the inn's 18th century cobbled courtyard, now viewable under glass in, uh, the gent's toilet. My last stop before heading home was to Healham Bridge. Built in 1796, this beck crossing near Leeming is now marooned between the old A1 and the new A1M. The Great North Coaching Road was built atop Roman Deer Street, and there was a substantial roadside settlement here, possibly supplying mules to the Roman army and the state-mandated postal service. 
The route of the motorway was diverted in 2010 so as not to destroy this important site. These were just a few of the oddities and highlights of Britain's most strategic highway. Take a detour from today's A1 and A1M and travel instead on the old A1, the Great North Road.